thank you for the wonderful way you have participated tonight in our period of worship. Thank you to each of you who join us online and by a conference call. Uh, tonight we want to bring to a close the last lesson in our series that we've looked at the third Sunday nights uh, this year on what we've called tackling the tough stuff. And there have been a number of subjects that we have looked at that uh, have been uncomfortable. I'll just say it because they have been. And I know that some uh, in a setting like this um, perhaps would even prefer not to have uh, these subjects considered. Uh, but they are things that we deal with in life that others that we try to deal with also are facing. And so we need to be able to have an answer. Uh, and if our God is our God that loves us and we know that he is and if his word provides us with what we need to make it, as we try to live in this life in preparation for the next, then certainly he provides us information on that, um, you know, that set of subjects that you might put under the category of tough stuff. And hopefully you've been able to see that a little bit more clearly through our times of study this year. Uh, tonight, bringing that to a close, we want to look at one final tough stuff subject, and it's this one, depression. Now, the very mention of that word for some people is difficult. I realize that. And uh, last week, or excuse me, last month, we looked at the topic of suicide. Again, both of these topics are those that we would prefer not to deal with. And yet we live in a world where they are uh, an everyday problem for millions of people. And even many that wear the name of the Savior also deal with uh, problems such as these. Many, of course, that end up terminating their own lives, do so out of a very deep time of depression. And so what do we mean by the use of that word and what can we do uh, to try to help? What can those who struggle, what hope can we provide and give them? This is unfortunately the time of year that according to research, more people who struggle in this way say that this is the most difficult time of the year. I know the song says it's the most wonderful time of the year and for many people it is. But for many people who struggle with mental health, this is truly one of the most challenging times of the year. So I thought I would save it for last and um, hopefully we can be helpful uh, tonight in what we have to say and consider from the Word of God. I've been prayerful about this and even some that I've shared uh, in preparation telling those uh, that I thought would find it helpful that this lesson was coming, uh, talked about that they were expecting it and anticipating it, would hopefully even be able to not only grow uh, from the study, but also even share it with others. So there may be some watching this later, and I would encourage you if you have someone that you can help, uh, point them to our YouTube channel and hopefully they can tune in even at a later date than tonight uh, to study and to help better understand this important topic. Well, what are we talking about when we use that word uh, depression? Here is the uh, technical definition. It's a negative affective state ranging from unhappiness and discontent to an extreme feeling of sadness, pessimism, and despondency that interferes with daily life. Various physical, cognitive, and social changes also tend to co-occur, that is, occurring at the same time, including altered eating or sleeping habits, lack of energy or motivation, difficulty concentrating or making decisions, and withdrawal from social activities. It is symptomatic of a number of mental health disorders. I'm not qualified as a professional to give you professional guidance uh, in this area. So please know that the perspective that I am bringing is only one uh, from, it would be called from a pastoral counseling perspective, even though I'm not a pastor in the true biblical sense of the usage of that term in the New Testament, but we're looking at it strictly from that vantage point and not from a mental health provider licensed to provide guidance in that area. But if you need help in that way, we'll certainly point you in the direction of people who can help. The Bible talks about this in a number of places. Uh, the only time when the word is explicitly used uh, in the New King James Version, that is the word depression, is found in Proverbs 12, 25. The wise man makes an observation that all of us have probably from time to time in our own lives confirmed the truthfulness of. Anxiety, worry, and you can include a whole range of other words that are synonymous with those ideas. Anxiety in the heart of a man, of a person, causes depression. But a good word makes it glad. There's a contrast, of course. Life has a way of getting us down. In fact, the word there for depression in the original language means to bow down. And it can be used in a positive way if you are paying honor 
and uh, some of the words or some of the psalms that even mention bowing down in the presence of God. That is, we're acknowledging His greatness. But here, the connotation is certainly a negative one, that anxiety and fear and worry and the troubles of life can cause us to stoop, can press us down, can weigh us down and cause depression and affect us not only just with our mental state, but that can also, of course, lead to other ramifications in our physical well-being, even in our spiritual vitality. So uh, we know the words of the wise man are true. What we have to understand as we begin this study tonight is that everyone uh, can be, and sometimes even the statement is made, well, everyone is depressed from time to time. And there is a sense in which every one of us uh, if we've lived any length of time, we have some children in the audience tonight. They may not yet know what this is, uh, but it happens probably even before they reach high school. Uh, they too will experience what we sometimes call the Monday morning blues. Uh, there are times in life when we just have down times. Uh, there are things that uh, just happen uh, that, you know, we don't like. And as a result, we feel sadness over uh, you know, that experience. Uh, certainly depression, as we're using the term tonight, is also more intense than what might be called situational sadness. And again, most all of us will at some point in our life, usually multiple times in our life, have this sort of situational sadness that is sometimes also classified as depression. Uh, the easiest way to, of course, illustrate this, and it's one that I'm want to be sure to be kind in the way I express it, but it's nevertheless true. Research has proven it out. Kubler-Ross is the lady that kind of gets credit for it. But when you experience significant loss, that is the loss of a loved one in death, part of the bereavement grieving process uh, is not only denial that the death has occurred, anger that the death has occurred, or that it's in prospect of occurring. Uh, then there is sometimes the bargaining that the grieving person has, that is bargaining with God, that if, they if He would do this, then they would do that, or if they do this, then maybe God would you do that. And uh, you kind of see this progression. And then uh, once it's kind of really sunk in, <clears throat> and um, I know we have so many tonight, and you're missing a spouse or a parent or a sibling or some other loved one. I know there are those listening tonight uh, that they're right in the midst of this. What do you do? What do you do when you wake up in the morning and they're not next to you? Or even if you're able to sleep, if you in the middle of the night, you reach for them and they're not there. What about that empty chair at the dinner table? All of those things that come in grief, depression, this situational sadness is a natural result. And sometimes those in the grief process will even make statements like, I feel like I'm going crazy. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to get on with life. I can't adjust. And they think something's wrong. Really, it's not. It's the way God made us. And that depression, that situational sadness is part of the grieving process. And uh, certainly you can get stuck in that. And we want to help people, and that's why we need to be involved in each other's lives to help people progress through that time of grief onto a time of greater hopefulness and coping in a better way. But what we're saying tonight is that depression, as we're defining it, is even more intense than that. That is certainly very intense, but the word that we're, or the way that we're using the word depression tonight is even different than this. And we're talking about it more in what you might say a clinical way. And um, this is a problem. The latest research, and we expect, uh, I think this number was from 2020, so not even 2020 was over yet. And uh, I couldn't find anything more recent than that that I thought was verifiable. And uh, so I expect this number to jump, maybe even exponentially so. But in 2020, more than 3 million diagnoses had been made in the United States alone. More than 3 million individuals. Now, they know, we know that that number is greatly, uh, you know, not exaggerated, but underestimated because there are so many others that go undiagnosed, that don't seek any treatment or help, and that suffer in silence, as it were. And so what that number actually is, I don't know. But it's likely that you know someone, and it may be you, uh, that deal with this, uh, at least if not on an ongoing basis, at least from time to time. What causes this? Uh, we read in God's Word, it says anxiety in the heart of a man, anxiety in our uh, thinking, some of the troubles of life, that can cause us uh, depre to be depressed. Well, what are some other causes? Usually there is not just one causation 
factor. Uh, there are others, biological, psychological, and even social sources of distress contribute to this issue. And even most of the time, uh, even spiritual causes can contribute to a depressive episode. Uh, tonight, we cannot be exhaustive. I literally, you know, we could keep you here until midnight and not address every possible uh, situation and scenario and facet of this sort of study. But uh, sometimes it's uh, no doubt true that uh, there are uh, so many things working in conjunction with each other. We might even say working against each other in the person's life. Uh, that causes these depressive states to come on. And even sometimes, for those of us who are interested in serving God, that can have, at least partially, a spiritual explanation. Now, we're going to uh, end the lesson. I'll go ahead and tell you now with some what I'm going to call myths of depression. And uh, they come from what we often hear in a church setting uh, that are not true. And sometimes uh, the idea that uh, if an individual who claims to be a child of God is depressed, that there's always a spiritual reason why... Uh, that's not factual. Uh, that's a myth. That's a falsehood, in fact. And we'll explore that, though, momentarily. But I'm just saying now that sometimes it can include that. But many, many factors uh, in a, an individual's life. Now, you may say, well, preacher, are you sure uh, this is something we need to talk about in this setting? Don't we need to just reserve that for uh, something else? Don't we need to, you know, just let the doctors and the psychologists and the, um, you know, counselors deal with that issue? Well, it's a biblical topic. Let me show you where. Just a few places. We can't look at any of these uh, again tonight in great depth, but in 1 Kings chapter 19, Elijah, the great prophet of God, uh, if you want to describe his state, I think the best way to describe it, he's depressed. And what's amazing is that he has just won a great victory uh, when in chapter 18, the chapter previous at Mount Carmel, he had challenged the false prophets of Baal, and he had shown them that the true God of heaven is the only God. And uh, you might think he's on top of the world. And so it seems that he is, but his enemy, King Ahab, and her, uh, that is Jezebel, the wife of Ahab, they're not happy with what God's prophet had done. And so uh, they basically send out a message just saying, Elijah, you're going to die. We're going to kill you. We'll take care of you, and uh, we'll keep serving these false gods like we want to. And so the Bible says in uh, 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 3, he ran. He ran away for his life to Beersheba. And he goes about a day's journey into the wilderness. He sits down underneath a broom tree, whatever kind of tree that was. Some people say a juniper tree. And listen to what he says in 1 Kings 19 verse 4. He prayed that he might die. That's serious, folks. And he said, it is enough. Now, Lord, take my life for I am no better than my father's. He's discouraged, yes. But more than that, I would say he's depressed. And all of us, preachers, elders, deacons, Bible class teachers, you've probably felt this way too. I've tried my best to do what you want me to do, God, and look what it's got me. I've only been opposed and oppressed and discouraged and mistreated. So just go ahead and take my life. He's depressed. Now we'll notice a little bit later in the lesson what God tells him to do. And there's some excellent counsel here, as we would expect from God himself, that he gives to his prophet in how to deal with this issue that can even be helpful to us today. But we'll come back to that later. When you think of other characters, go to the book of Job and you'll find a man that is depressed. Now, it's true that his depression largely results from the situation uh, that befalls him. As he is minding his own business, seemingly God and Satan have a wager in heaven. It's an amazing account that chapters 1 and 2 detail between God and the evil one. Job doesn't know any of this is taking place. He only knows that everything he held dear, first his possessions, and he didn't hold them as dear as he did his children. Uh, and it concludes chapter 1 with all of his children dying on the same day. He's in great grief, but he still blesses the Lord. In chapter 2, after the devil fails to make Job curse God from those misfortunes, God allows Job uh, and allows the devil to take the health of Job away from him, striking him with these boils of some sort, blisters from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. And still, Job would not curse God. We give a hard time to Job's wife when she says, Why do you maintain your integrity? And the question she's really asking is, How much more can God hate you? That's what she thinks is happening. Now, she's mistaken for sure. But I can understand and maybe cut her a little slack. You're suffering more than any man's ever suffered. Just curse God and die. Evidently, God's so displeased with you. 
what good is it that you continue to live? Is the question she poses to him. He said, you speak as one of the foolish women speak. Should we accept good and not adversity? In, those, in all of this, Job did not sin with his lips. It's remarkable. Now, that's his high point. His friends, for seven days, show up. For a week, they say nothing. That's the high point of their interaction with Job. Beginning in chapter 4, they're going to try to counsel him. But they make terrible mistakes and making false charges against him repeatedly for the remainder of the book. But in chapter 3, Job's depressed. How do I know that? Verse 3, he says, May the day perish on which I was born, the night in which it was said a male child is conceived. May that day be darkness. Uh, those that have studied this much more in depth than I have said that Job may have even been pattering his lament after what's called a counter-cosmic incantation, which is just a fancy way of saying, God, I wish I'd never been born. That's how great his suffering was. And I've talked with people in their depressed state that said, I, I don't know why I'm God ever let me live, or I don't know why uh, I have to live even another day. And that's when sometimes suicide ideation comes into play and a lot of other dangerous things. But Job is depressed and he's discouraged. Amazingly, his uh, story ends, of course, with his validation by God that his faith was well placed even after uh, he had questioned God all throughout the book. And that's another story, another, I guess, lesson for another time. Uh, but realize that Job was here one suffering, and as a result of that suffering, greatly depressed. Think about Jonah. Now, Jonah is an interesting case for sure, especially uh, as it relates to depression, because most of the time, us preachers, if we're depressed, it's because we're not successful. Jonah is the only preacher who is depressed because of his success. Now, you may say, I don't know about that. I can prove it to you. Jonah, you remember, runs away in chapter 1 because he doesn't want to go to the evil uh, Ninevite uh, empire and tell them that God would grant forgiveness if they repented. But uh, through the big fish, God convinces him otherwise. Finally, he goes into the city. He preaches. And just like he was dreading, the people repent from the king down to the lowest man on the street. Look how chapter 4 opens. Chapter 4, verse 1. It displeased Jonah exceedingly. He became angry. God didn't destroy his enemies, the enemies of the Jews. He didn't wipe them out. He's going to spare them. And so he goes outside the city and he said, God, I told you this would happen. I knew how merciful you were, how gracious you are, how you're a God delighting in abundant loving kindness. You're slow to anger. What's he say in verse 3? Now, O Lord, please take my life for me, for it is better for me to die than to live. He's depressed, but not for a good reason at all. And we could uh, certainly highlight some of these causative factors that in his life are dysfunctional in a very, very significant way. Uh, and God tries to even show him his grace. And Jonah uh, isn't going to be uh, receptive of that concerning a plant and other things. And, and the story ends. What's amazing about uh, the ending of the book of Jonah is we're left with Jonah there, you know, just still lamenting, still depressed, still distraught over the grace and mercy of God, but clearly a case of depression. Coming to the New Testament, there will be some who will automatically throw their hands up in objection and say, you can't use Jesus. Let me take you to John chapter 11, John chapter 12, and John chapter 13. I've just provided you the verse in the middle. But as Jesus nears Calvary, I want you to notice very remarkably how the writer, John, of this gospel calls forth in record the reaction of Jesus. In chapter 11, you remember his friend Lazarus has died. And um, certainly the sisters, Mary and Martha, they're upset with the Lord. And we can understand why. And they make the charge. If you'd been here, my brother would not have died. You could have done something about this and you didn't. The Bible says when Jesus saw them weeping, you remember when they come to the tomb of Lazarus, he too weeps. That's John eleven thirty five. 35. That's the, if you will, uh, what we call just the Bible trivia, shortest verse in the Bible, and it is. But what's amazing about that is that the Bible says in verse 33, Jesus groaned in the spirit and was troubled. Now, it doesn't use the word depression there. It doesn't use the word worry there. But I think those words would certainly be synonyms because of the internal agitation that our Lord was feeling at that moment. And the Bible even says uh, that this idea further carries with it the original language sometimes the idea that the, uh, the way a horse would snort and exhale uh, in just frustration. And Jesus is feeling all of that when he comes to the tomb. 
And yes, he does bring Lazarus back to life, but notice that emotion. In chapter 12, verse 27, now the cross is even closer. Now they're approaching the city of Jerusalem. Now he tells them, as he had told them all along, but it seems like now these, these words are getting more pointed. And he says, now my soul, verse 27, is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. If you read the Gospel of John closely, you'll read phrases throughout scattered before this that precede that said his hour had not yet come or his time was not yet, depending on the version you're reading, something like that. What John is doing, he's kind of preparing us. Jesus had a mission and it was the cross. And he said it wasn't going to happen on anyone's timeline, but his and God the Father's. But now in John 12, 27, this is the hinge of the entire book. In this gospel, Jesus said, now the hour has arrived. Think about knowing which Jesus did, what awaited him at the cross. What would you feel in that moment, knowing that now, this last week, as it was beginning to start, this would be the hour, in fact. This would be the time when he would die on the cross. Then in chapter 13, uh, now we're fast forwarding to the night before his arrest, or maybe even later on that night, depending on how you would work out the timeline. After watching these men that he had trained for over three years, fight and fuss over their own supposed greatness, he takes a towel, he takes the basin of water, he washes their dirty feet. And he said, do you know what I've done for you? I think that's a statement, much like John 6, 66, when he says, Will you also go away? He actually asked that in verse uh, 65. I think it's a very, um, a very crucial moment. And I think the Lord asks it with a tinge probably of great sadness and sorrow. Do you know what I've done for you? You boys are fussing about who's going to be great and I am your master. I'm the one who created even the dust that made your feet dirty to begin with. And I've washed your dirty feet. Haven't you learned anything? Over these last few years, it might be what he was thinking, might be what he was saying. I don't know. But nevertheless, when the Bible says that he had completed that task, uh, the Bible says in verse 21, when Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. It was bad enough that these 12 had not learned the lesson of humble service that Jesus had shown them. But now he knows the time for Judas to do what he was going to do is at hand. And now he sends Judas out on that task. Would he have been troubled, discouraged, depressed, anxious, worried, fearful in those moments? Yes, because in some way, even though he was 100% God, he was also 100% man. And further, you might say, can you be sure that Jesus was, if you want to use the word depressed? Isaiah 53 verse 3 said he was a man acquainted with grief. That's what Isaiah said about him as the suffering servant. He was acquainted with grief. That is, he understands. And furthermore, if Hebrews 4 means anything, and it must, that he knows how we face life, tempted in all points as we are yet without sin, that in some way he too had to experience these difficulties in life that we do. And so maybe even Jesus himself would be an example in these regards. Paul in Philippians chapter 1 verse 21 to 23, he speaks in a way uh, that somewhat would even be indicative uh, today if uh, he were to be overheard in a counseling setting. This might be the diagnosis that he received because he said, For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. An individual that's in the midst of a great time of suffering will sometimes say, and they'll mean it, and they'll say it with great sincerity, you know, I just wish I could die. That would be preferable. That would be better. Now, if you hear someone say that, be very cautious and careful in how you respond. Because you could push them to do something that you would later terribly regret. But Paul said, I'm in jail in this Roman prison, this dungeon. I know what's waiting for me. If I live on the flesh, I'll keep serving God. But he said, I'm in a hard plus spot. I'm in the rock and the hard place, verse 23. Hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. That's so much better. I, I know, Paul said, and that's what I would desire. And so maybe even he. Now, we could add a number of individuals in Scripture to this list. 
If you read the book of Psalms with any discernment whatsoever, you'll find David expressing what I think are the cries and the longings of a man depressed. You'll find some other Psalms that are not even named, at least the authorship of them. There's no attribution as to who wrote them, but you'll hear them say, Out of the depths of my sorrow I cried to the Lord. You'll hear the psalmist say that I made my bed like a, a sea of tears. What are they describing? They're talking about those dark nights of the soul, and they can happen in the daytime as well. But they're talking about great times of mental anguish. They're talking about uh, when they are in immense and intense sorrow and sadness. And those times still plague mankind tonight. Now, what do we do? How do we help? How do we cope? Let me give you just these a uh, few suggestions, and then I'm going to pr I promise you these myths that we'll go through rather rapidly. Number one, seek help. Seek help. And that help should be multifaceted. Spiritual, medical, and mental assistance is all needed. Now, it may be true that if an individual uh, is dealing with maybe some sin in their life, and they are unrepentant of that sin, and it's gnawing at them, and it's causing them great distress and great sadness, then it might be as simple as saying, even though it might hurt, even though it might be embarrassing, even though it might be shameful, you need to repent and seek God's forgiveness. He's a merciful and gracious God. That might clear up the difficulty they're having. Other times, an individual that might be dealing with this depressed, ongoing state of sadness and sorrow, it can be a medical issue. One of the first things that I do when someone wants my counsel and they say, you know, I just can't get out of this funk or I'm just sad all the time, I ask them to go see their medical provider. It could be uh, things like a thyroid issue, sometimes your adrenal glands, sometimes uh, other processes within the body that I'm not qualified to make any evaluation of uh, can be measured and you know, treatment can be given that will sometimes clear this up. And then of course, uh, many times and uh, always I think it would be wise for an individual dealing with this, see a mental health professional, see someone that is trained in this area that can help you, that can uh, talk with you and find out maybe what is some root cause if there is one. And many times there may not even be one root cause or trigger, but they can provide you with some coping skills and some uh, therapy assistance that will make this uh, better and might even refer you on to someone else uh, for in the medical field uh, some sort of uh, even assistance like uh, with pharmaceuticals that could help in that regard. Going back to First Kings, uh, you remember I told you about uh, Elijah and what Elijah was told to do. If you go back to First Kings chapter 18, you'll discover uh, that when Elijah is there and he tells God, just go ahead and kill me. You know, it's no good for me to live. There's no one else that wants to serve you uh, like I do. So uh, what do you do? Well, uh, God tells him, uh, you need to kind of buck up, old buddy. You need to understand uh, that there is things that God has provided for you. And what you can do is you can eat, and God provided that for him. You can rest, and he needed to do that, and you need to exercise. And uh, the Bible says he does all of those things. Uh, I know you've heard that before, but it's easy in life to get these out of balance. It's easy not to eat well. It's easy not to uh, have good sleeping habits. It's easy uh, not to get enough physical activity. And you may say, well, uh, that's just all uh, nonsense. It's, it's true. Research bears it out. And most of us, from our own practical experiences, know sometimes we get imbalanced in these areas and it causes us not to uh, feel well even mentally. So uh, look at that capacity. And then use healthy coping skills to deal with stress and anxiety uh, before this becomes uh, a big issue. And like I said, uh, if that's something that you're not acquainted with or don't know exactly what that will involve, um, you know, ask and we'll help you uh, gain uh, information and assistance in that way uh, to make it better for you. But uh, that's kind of depression. Now, what I said I wanted to do, and I want you to hear this because this is just kind of the, um, this was all the clinical stuff, maybe the abstract. Now let's get down to really what we're talking about, okay? And the best way that I know how to do this is to look at 10 myths very quickly about what many people think depression is. And this list is not original to me. Uh, I give credit to one of my major professors at Fried Hardeman who himself struggled in that way. And uh, he was often asked by people to, you know, comment on this. And uh, so he wrote this and actually presented it in a lecture that I heard. And I've uh, kept a copy of it all of these years. And I want you to hear these myths very clearly uh, because I think he is well within his right of expertise and experience to give them to us. Number one, many people say depression is sinful. And that is absolutely factually inaccurate and incorrect. Uh, there are a number of people, preachers, uh, elders, and otherwise that I've heard and read in print that have made that assertion that it is a sin to be 
depressed and that it's some sort of punishment from God, a correction for moral weakness or something of the sort, uh, that could not be farther from the truth. Now, again, we kind of have to always say and issue a disclaimer, it is possible. It is certainly uh, the case that uh, if I am dealing with unrepentant sin in my life and it's eating me from the inside, which is what exactly sin will do, uh, then it may be true that there is some causation for the way that I'm feeling because of my sinful lifestyle. But uh, be very aware that when statements like this are made, that depression is sinful, you're doing a great disservice to those who really struggle for whatever reason, whether it's a medical uh, issue as it relates to their physiology, brain chemistry, or otherwise, whether it's uh, some mental dysfunction that's going on in their thinking or coping skills, or even some other factor altogether, please uh, be aware that that is a myth, that depression is sinful. Number two, depression is a lack of faith, kind of the same idea. I don't know how many of you know people that deal with this on an ongoing basis. I know dozens right at this very hour. And uh, of those dozens, the great majority of them are Christians. And they are some of the most faithful people that I know. It's nonsense to suggest that they lack faith. And, um, you know, we don't use this sort of reasoning with anything else. You know, people say, well, you know, if you just had more faith, uh, you wouldn't have heart disease. You don't say that, do you? If you had more faith, you wouldn't have diabetes. You, you don't say stuff like that. And uh, why we do with this particular malady of our mind and body, uh, I don't know, but many do. Number three, again, just kind of related to the previous point. Some people say, well, depression, you can cure that if you're more spiritual. You're more spiritual. If you just pray more and study your Bible more, you wouldn't feel like that. If you're suffering and you've heard that, you have my sympathy. No doubt you probably have, again, from well-meaning uh, Christians. And most of those uh, people, again, that I know that struggle with this issue, again, are some of those faithful children of God that I know. They spend immense amounts of time in study and in prayer, and they're still not able to shake or to overcome uh, this difficulty that uh, they face. And so uh, that's something we need to be aware of as a myth. It's a falsehood. Number four, uh, this is one that um, some people would say even further depressing, but I, I think it has to be stated. Depression is something you can end. People tend to have the idea, well, you got yourself into that. You get yourself out of it. You ought to be able to handle that. But that's not true either. Um, I remember this particular gentleman that I borrowed these from. Uh, he said he was listening in another setting uh, to an individual. And uh, this preacher uh, said, you know, we can cure all of our problems if our mind can conceive it, the body can achieve it. And uh, he said what was so kind of ironic about that, he said in front of him was sitting an individual that was blind and had been blind from his birth. And he said, don't you imagine that blind man would have wanted to and had conceived in his mind many times over what it would be like to see? But of course, just conceiving that you can change blindness isn't going to fix the problem and neither will it in this case. Number five, some people say depression is all about the same. And some people say, well, you know, you're discouraged, but everyone gets uh, discouraged, we all have to, you know, have our own cross to bear. Please don't make statements like that. Um, those kinds of ideas, those kind of flippant, dismissive statements are hurtful. They're terribly hurtful to those uh, who really suffer. And it's true, there is a range of severity. There is a range where uh, some people will have, you know, a day or a couple of weeks, maybe even a couple of months, and then they pull out very easily from these things. That's what we hope takes place, especially uh, in a time of bereavement. But there are other people for which this is an ongoing battle, and it has been for years, and maybe even lifelong. So, And so please be aware of not making foolish statements like this. Number six, some people say, well, depression, that's completely genetic. And, uh, you know, you just get it because that's what your daddy had, or that's what your mama had. That's a possibility, but not always uh, the case. And uh, we don't know an exact number of percentage assigned to it. Uh, but if you are one who is struggling, even though you may not have that in your family history, still get checked out and still get help uh, because genetics isn't the only uh, thing that plays into it. Number seven, we've addressed this, but it has to be st said again, depression is situational. You'll get over it or get through it sometime later. Again, there are life-changing events. If you've had a spouse for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, some of our folks recently that amount of time and you lose that one that you love, uh, yes, you'll be sad. There's no doubt about 
that, and you should not feel bad about feeling bad in those instances, but uh, it's much more than just situational. There's a lot of other things, again, that can factor into it. Number eight, depression is a chemical imbalance. Sometimes it is, and uh, that's why I said we have to be careful in the statements we make. We don't say to an individual with any other health condition uh, that they should get over it. Uh, again, it does very little good uh, to tell an individual who's dealing with cancer or heart disease or uh, you name the malady that they can just get over it as it were. And for some people, because of uh, the physiology in the body and in the brain, that imbalance uh, results in depression and uh, carefully prescribed medication is needed uh, to help them get through that. And uh, if you'll allow me just to put a kind of a parenthesis here, I think it needs to be stated, uh, if you're an individual that needs help in this area and you are uh, reluctant to seek help, people have told me this, you know, I don't want to go to the doctor because they might give me, you know, medicine. I don't want anybody to think I'm whatever, fill in the blank with whatever word you choose to use. Uh, please don't let that hold you back. And please, if you are uh, taken or you are given under the guidance of a medical professional uh, or a mental health professional, uh, guidance as it relates to a medication that can help you, please uh, do that as they prescribed. You know, don't believe the lies uh, that someone may try to tell you about, um, you know, the need to take some other approach. Um, take uh, that uh, necessary guidance, especially if it's uh, in regards, again, maybe to some imbalance that can be corrected through medication. And that's number nine. Uh, depression can be cured by using only medication. That's not true uh, either. Some people are always looking for another pill to take. I realize that, and that's a problem in some regards. And uh, we don't need to be uh, so, um, you know, eager to do that. But at the same time, we don't need to be so oblivious or so uh, foolish to think that there are those who cannot, with training in this area, help us uh, in that way. And so uh, be aware uh, that there is some balance that needs to be understood in that. There's oftentimes not just with the medication, but with uh, some cognitive behavioral therapy uh, assistance that can help an individual know how better to think and process these things. So please uh, make sure you're working in that regard. And here's the last one. It's always curable. The sad fact of the matter is it's not. What we're talking about tonight when we're talking about those who are dealing with chronic depression or even clinical uh, depression, it, it may leave you for a while and it may come back. And it may come back even more, um, more stringently, more intensively than it did uh, before. And what those of us who may not be sufferers or even suffering at the moment, if we did at other times, what we must do is be compassionate for those people who are. We must be so kind and we must be uh, so loving to listen and to try to care, uh, to not be you know, foolish enough to be judgmental, to make these off-the-cuff remarks that are only harmful. Uh, please don't do that. And so I'm going to leave you with this and the lesson's yours. You've been so wonderful to listen so well tonight. Um, if you need help, get it. I know there's still a stigma, and um, there's still the idea, you know, well, if the preacher really knew that, um, you know, he uh, could study more, if this person really uh, trusted God a little more, you know, please just throw all of that out. If you're struggling this way, reach out for help. Two numbers, they're very easy to remember, of course, everyone knows the 911 number, but there's another number, especially in a time of crisis, uh, 988. That will connect you 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all 365 days of the year with a trained professional who can provide some stability for you and would also be able to make other referral and recommendation in this area for how to get help. So please uh, get help if needed. And if you don't struggle. Tonight, I would like to say that everyone in this audience, um, you know, you're all saying, well, that's good. Uh, maybe someday I'll meet somebody that struggles in that way. I know that's not true. Uh, a lot of us have had different struggles in this area, whether individually with ourselves and our own lives or with our families. And so if you're not in that group and you're one of those who don't struggle, count yourself blessed. Thank God uh, for the opportunity in your time of strength, maybe then to show love and compassion in your words and deeds toward those who do. And uh, that's what we need to do as the people of God. Uh, I didn't tell Daryl to lead it and he didn't know the content of this lesson tonight, but we were singing uh, just before our prayer, you remember there are no tears in heaven. And uh, isn't that a wonderful, wonderful thought, especially for those who struggle in this way, 
uh, I heard one man, he talked about that, was a favorite song of his. Uh, another uh, said that he always sung it, usually with a little bit of a tear in his eye, everybody will be happy over there. And that's the promise we have because of Jesus. The difficulties, the distresses, the worries, the troubles, the fears in life, they are meaning for all of us, whether this is your particular problem tonight or not, whether you're trying to help someone with this problem or not, whether none of this whatsoever applied, and you might even say, I, I wasted my time tonight, please don't feel that way. Instead, look at Revelation chapter 21 and read that blessed promise contained in verse 4, where God says, one day I'm going to wipe away every tear from every eye, that is for those, of course, who have lived as he teaches, who have been granted uh, through his son Jesus, a home with him in heaven. No sorrow, no pain, no sickness, no sorrow, no death. The former things have passed away. And although the devil will try, and I, I don't know what even responsibility to assign to him in a question like this tonight, uh, that's another study for another uh, time. I know life is hard, it's difficult. There are so many worries and burdens that we all carry, but know that with Jesus, we can carry them. With his help, we can make it. And with his help, one day, we'll be in his presence forever. And there won't have to be another worry about any of these things forever and forever and forever. How wonderful that is. What great hope that is. Tonight, if that hope is not yours, I can't offer you the promise that life will be automatically easier. That is, by your simple obedience to the gospel, things in life may still be tough. But the great news is, your soul will be made clean through the blood of Jesus. Your sins will be forgiven through your obedience to the gospel. Believing in Jesus, turning away from sin and being baptized into Christ tells us He takes away our sin. Does He take away our struggles? No, we'll still have adversity. James says our faith will still be tried. But with that trial, we have the expectation and the knowledge that now because I'm a child of God, I have His help. And I have the help of an entire Christian family to assist me in those difficulties. Tonight, if you're not a Christian, we want to help you in that way. We want you to leave this place rejoicing, knowing your sins are forgiven and know that you now have help to deal with whatever life may put before you. Tonight, if you are a child of God, if this struggle is yours or some other struggle uh, is yours, please uh, let us help. I know, again, there's a great amount of fear and maybe even uh, uncertainty if I share or if I say or what will they think. What we'll think is that you're very brave, that you're courageous, that you need help carrying your burdens. And that's exactly what Galatians 6 says. My job is to help you and your job is to help me. And we help one another bear those burdens and fulfilling the law of Christ. And with Jesus, we can get through, we can make it, and we can live in such a way faithful to Him so that a home in heaven is ours eternally. And especially uh, if it is the case tonight that you're a Christian. And there is sin in your life. I hope it discourages you. I hope it depresses you. I hope it eats you from the inside out until you get rid of it. That may sound mean to say, but I think that's exactly uh, the contrast. That for the child of God, trying to live as God wants us to live, we don't need to tolerate sin. All of us do, maybe more than we should sometimes. But we need to remove it from our lives. And maybe tonight, your need to pray and to repent is also something that you should take care of even before you leave this place. Again, as we can help you, uh, please make that known to us now or otherwise. But please, uh, tonight especially, if you're subject to the gospel, make that known. Come as we stand and sing together.